This is the second in a mess his series, Living with a Purpose. I won't ask for hands this morning. How many knew what they were doing when they got to bed this morning? Uh, I, I usually don't until I've had my about third cup of coffee, and then I, I feel pretty good after that. But uh, hopefully, in Christ, you know why you're here, you know what you're doing. And uh, we're going to examine some of that this morning, and, and I hope that this makes sense to you. Why don't you stand with me, please, as we look at Acts chapter 9. In verse 1, and one, the Bible says, And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven, and he fell to the earth and heard his heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And they said, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go unto the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. Drop down to verse number 13. And in Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard by many of this man how much evil he hath done to thy saints at Jerusalem. And here he hath authority from the chief priest to bind all that call on thy name. But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me, to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how great things he must suffer. For my name's sake. Heavenly Father, I pray this morning as we look into your word that we are privileged to have a copy of the word of God. We're privileged for the most part to be enjoying a, a great morning in your house. And I know that there are some folks that are suffering physically and possibly hurting even in this room this morning. And I pray that you'd be close to them. But we have to realize that there are times where prosperity is not promised but suffering is. I pray regardless of our circumstances this morning would be pleased to live for you, to serve you, to know why we got out of bed this morning, to live with a purpose. Help us to understand this as we study your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. you may be seated. To do a little bit of a recap, last week we looked at Revelation chapter 1 and verse 19. You don't need to go to it. But the Bible says, write these things which thou hast seen, and the things which are, and the things which shall be. Write what you saw in the past, write what you are seeing right now, and write what you will see in the future. Past, present, and future. It's interesting to me that in the book of Revelation is broken down those three ways, and I believe it's those three things that motivate you and I, or give us a purpose or a process in life that... Our thinking takes place based on those three things of past, present, and future in our life. We frame our thinking and our decisions by what we've seen, what we presently know, and what we are looking forward to. Our past shapes our present. Say that with me. Our past shapes our present. Now, obviously, everything to this point in our life is history. Right now, Sunday school we just had is history. The songs, the worship songs that we've already sung, those are history. The present is now, moving forward is the future, so the present window that we are in right now could be broken down to an extremely small period of time, but that's not how we look at the present. We look at the present as being today, this week, what is, seems like within reach of our abilities of making decisions and doing things, the things that we actually think we have power over, which in reality we have power over nothing other than our relationship with Jesus Christ. But the present is what we're shaping our thought life with and how we're paying our bills and, and the associations and the friendships that we have. Those are all in the present. And we make those present choices, those day-to-day those -day choices, based on what we've learned in the past in, in our history, and if you will, in world history. And you've all been told, and I believe that those that don't learn from history will be forced to repeat it. That's world history. And obviously we can learn great, hist great lessons 
from those that have gone before us as a parent. My, my daughter and son-in-law are here, and I don't spend a lot of time telling them what I think they should do. I, pretty much, I recognize they won't listen, okay? But the reality of it is, is that as a parent, you want so much for your children, those that you love, to learn from your history so they won't repeat your mistakes, okay? Isn't that true? I can see some of you nodding heads, and of course, some of you made no mistakes, so you can't relate to that, but I made a few myself. So in that process, you want people to learn from your history, but the reality is this, you might as well accept it, the history they're really going to learn from is their own history, their personal history. The, the wins, the losses, the choices, the failures, those are the ones we really learn from. And hopefully, we don't repeat our past mistakes, but human nature being what it was. But our past, our past shapes our present. Let me illustrate that to you in a couple of ways. I'm in church today because in the past I gave my heart and life to Jesus Christ. Now, I just this isn't in my notes, but I noticed Pastor Franklin is back with us, and I... I dedicated my life under his ministry. The de short decisions that I make as, a, as the pastor of this church, I can go back to my history of the Bangor Baptist Church and walking down the aisle, a long aisle, feeling like you were going to fall down halfway down there, petrified, all of those things. I recognize that invitation time, there's a lot of forces going against you, but let me encourage you to work through those forces because God wants to meet with you. And based on those decisions, I'm here today. That's my past history. But as a Christian, I gave my life to Jesus Christ. In the present, I have found that serving and obeying him has brought me great satisfaction. And in the future, I hope to win as many people as possible to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ and to see him personally face to face in the coming days or years. Okay? So in the past, I trusted Christ. Today, I hope I'm serving Christ, and I'm looking forward to the future of actually seeing Christ. Okay? Past, present, future. Here's another one. You came in a vehicle today that you purchased based on a belief that in the past, that vehicle has a good track record. Maybe you read consumer reports. Maybe you talk to someone. You know, this could be a blender in your kitchen. It could be a vehicle you drove in. It could be a sound system that you sing into. Whatever it is, you've done a little bit of research. You recognize that it has a past track record that you thought was worthwhile. So you came in that vehicle. You found it to be reliable in its use and that you hope that you will continue to be reliable in the future, future at a minimal maintenance cost. Okay? Meaning you don't have to dump a whole lot of money into it to keep it on the road. Okay, Now, it doesn't really matter what it is unless, now when it comes to a vehicle, unless you grew up in a home like I did that had a cheap skate father that said, you're going to drive whatever I put you in, and by golly, we didn't drive much, you know. I always, I, I always wanted a vehicle that was a babe magnet. I'm just sharing my heart here, you know, and <laughs> I'm thinking, Dad, I ain't ever going to get a girl to go out with me driving this thing, you know. That wasn't his concern. And I'll tell you what, I thank God that my parents didn't give me everything when I was young. You know, we're, we're doing way too much. We, the struggles are what shape us. Isn't that true in our Christian life? It's the struggles that shape us. And parent, you don't have to give your kids everything. That's not in my notes, just a little sidetrack there. <clears throat> so you can think this process through in about every area of life. I've not come up with any exceptions except... What you do for instant gratification. Many times today in our choices, it's not about what we've learned in the past or what we're looking for in the future. It's what about we want right now. I want what I want when I want it. And we make poor choices that have long-term consequences. And those consequences can be extremely difficult. They're known as self-inflicted storms. Be careful of the self-inflicted storms. There's some biblical examples. In our text this morning, we read from the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul, first called Saul, was raised in the highest form of religious belief of that day, only to find out through a direct encounter with God Almighty on the Damascus Road that what he had been taught was wrong. David killed a lion and killed a bear so that he could kill a giant. 
Jonah was called by God, ran from God, spent time in the belly of a whale so that he could preach a life-changing message to people who needed to change their lives. Moses was raised in Egypt, lived in a palace for 40 years, ran from that life to live in seclusion for 40 years so that in the remaining 40 years, he could lead God's people from the trials of slavery to the promises of God. Sometimes we excuse our behavior because of the way that we were treated in the past. And uh, I was, uh, uh, Gary Keffer was here recently, and he talked about being the middle child. Now, I, I'm not the middle child, I'm the youngest child, I was the best looking child, I was the smartest child, but I was never, I was never the middle child. So I can't relate to the whole middle child thing, but some people, if you're a middle child, then I suppose that's a hard thing, whatever, okay. Thank God you had a home and you grew up and whatever. But I'm, I'm, we'll make excuses about, I don't want to speculate, but it, really some of these excuses, in, in the, there's a term in our home that you're not allowed to say and you don't hear it in our home and it's called, it's not my fault. We don't allow you to say that. Because I'll tell you what, chances are if it happened, it is your fault. You know, it's a choice you made. Another one that just I just love hearing from uh, athletes when they go out and they dope or they drug or they get caught sniffing or whatever it is that drug use is and they say that's not who I am oh well, yeah it is pal you were doing it that is who you are you know what Christian sometimes the choices we make is exactly who we are we have excuses someone said and I like this someone said heat can harden clay or melt ice it is not the heat that is different, but the character and quality of the object that is affected. Isn't that interesting? You can harden clay or melt ice. What's the difference? Heat's the same. It's the character and quality of the object. You and I, it's not the trial that changes us. It's the trial that exposes who we are and the character and quality of the person that is being tried. Ouch. <clears throat> Yesterday, God prepared me for today. Today, God is preparing me for tomorrow. History, past, present, and future. Our past shapes our present. Our present is determined by how we see the past and the future. And I'll tell you, the reason why I've gotten into this vein of messages, and we'll continue it next week, is I'm concerned about the Cornerstone Baptist Church. I'm concerned about us as Christians. What question... I have a question for you. What do you think today about the things of God? Tozier says, what we think about God is the most important thing about us. So here we are on Sunday morning, August 19th, 2018. What do you think of God Almighty? Delt Hackett leader of the Truth Project. If you've done that, great. If you haven't, you ought to. He's got a question early on in the series. Do you really believe what you say you believe? Do you really believe what you say you believe? Say that with me. Do you really believe what you say you believe? So I'm going to tell you this morning what I believe. I want you to know what motivates me, and this isn't anything in particular. And I'd like for you after today, maybe this afternoon, maybe this evening, maybe through your devotions this week, Maybe you could just take a piece of paper and a pencil, and you could write down some of the things that you believe. It could be something as simple as my wife's home with a sick kid today, but it could be something as simple as I believe. I know my wife loves me. I know I have four kids that I adore. I know that God has given me physical health so that I can still continue to do the work that I do. Those are obvious things. But I think there are greater things than the love of my wife and the love of my kids and, and the things that are going on in my personal life. And the greatest thing that you and I can believe is that you and I were put here on purpose for a purpose. We were created to glorify God. And if we believe that, then you, do you really believe what you say you believe? Because that ought to shape some of the decisions that we're making. That ought to affect the fact whether we're willing to get out of bed on Sunday morning and be in Sunday school. That ought to affect whether we care about whether our kids are being taught the things of God. 
And I'm afraid that today and in the, in the weeks ahead, I know that the end times it talks about there'll be a falling away. And this isn't in my notes, but I'm just sharing with you some of the thoughts that I've been thinking about. And we worry about apostasy. But I'm more concerned about apathy. That in the last days, it seems like Christians that say they believe what they say they believe are just so apathetic about the whole process, they're not really engaged anymore. And we're just going along, and we come to church, and it's going to be good. There's an hour in church, and we're going to hear the music, and Stan's going to preach, and we're going to go home. And I like the line that I, I heard recently. One preacher said, I, I've decided that the exit doors of my church are giant erasers. Because everything I say, as soon as it's over and they go out through, they totally forget it. And I know he was joking, but you know, do we really believe what we say we believe? And if we do, it ought to be shaping some of the things that we're doing. It ought to motivate us to get out of bed in the morning. It ought to motivate us to get into God's Word. It ought to motivate us to tell some poor lost soul that's going to die and go to hell about Jesus Christ. It ought to do that. So the things that I believe. Number one, I like the old Billy Graham saying, the Bible says. Say that with me. The Bible says. Now, I know there are new preachers out today that are saying, don't say the Bible says. Say Paul says, say Timothy says, say whatever. But don't say the Bible says. That'll turn them off. I'm not too concerned about turning them off. I want them to understand that we have something we believe in. This is a foundational book, and the Bible says. And I'm not going to apologize for that. From Genesis 1, 1 to Revelation 22, 21, wherever it is, whatever is in it, this is where I believe, and I think it's worth investing your life in. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Revelation 22, 21, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Anything in between those two verses, I'm hanging my hat on. The Bible says. Not only that, the Bible says John 3, 16. We quote this from time to time. Let's say it together. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. John 3.36 says, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. We just said that in John 3.16. And he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. I'll tell you what, that worries me. You say, well, Stan, Christians aren't supposed to worry. I worry about the wrath of God on people that I love and care about. And you ought to worry about that too. Matthew 7, 13 to 14 says, and I'm sharing these, these are the verses that motivate me. Enter ye in at the straight gate. Straight, King James Version, is, is narrow, tight, tough, hard fit. Enter in at the straight gate. For wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Because straight or narrow or tough is the gate, and narrow is the way that leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Boy, that, that, that verse hurts me. I, I want everybody to be a Christian. What's, where's the downside here, folks? Why wouldn't you want to follow Christ? Why wouldn't you? Someone you can talk to, someone you can bear your heart and soul with, someone that died and loved you so much he'd rather die for you than live without you. He gave his life so that to pay your sin debt, whatever bill you have. Let's say you're deep in debt. Not, we're not talking spiritually, we're talking financially. Let's say every week your phone rings and you have to check the caller ID because you know it's the collection people and you don't want to talk to them because you've talked to them. There's nothing more to say. They're going to come and get you. Let's say it's the IRS, the most powerful collection agency in the world. Let's say they're coming after you and they're going to attach your wages. And let's just say someone comes into your life that has unbelievable resources. And let's just say they come along and they put their arm around you and say, look, I know you're deep in debt and I am sorry, but I want you to know I've got a big bag of money that can handle all that. No strings attached. I just want you to know I'm going to take care of that for you. How much do you need? You give him the amount. He just laughs. Is that all? Is that all? You're worried about that? Are you serious? 
and he writes out the amount to every creditor you have, and he pays off your entire debt. And then he looks at you and he says, I just want you to know that if anything else comes up, there's more where that came from. Now, do you think you'd want to be friends with that person? I don't know about you, but I'm thinking, what's that, Lori? Best buddies. What's they say, BFF or something? Oh, man, I like this guy. Well, you know what? My father owns a cattle on a thousand hills with wealth in every mind. I'm not talking prosperity here. I'm talking that you have no debt, spiritually speaking, that he can't handle. You have no situation that he didn't die for. There is nothing in your past that he can't take care of. He wants to be a friend that sticks closer than a brother. You can, the relationship that you, you can have with him, and I'm not making this up, is, is better than anything. And I know he, we, God made us for relationship. We need people. Now, I know I'm somewhat of a loner. I, I wish at times I could just go off and be gone. But that's the reality of it is they say that can't be done. I'd like to try, but they say you can't do it, okay? This is killing my message, I understand. But the reality of it is we need each other. And the, I, I've got, just to me, now to me, an awesome wife. I just love being around her. I tend, to, I tend to follow her through the house and stuff, and she's trying to get away, but I won't let her. And, and you know, I just... I, and the closeness I feel to her, I, I have a hard time describing, but I'm telling you, honestly, I feel that close to my Savior. The relationship you can have with him is unbelievable. And Satan will come along and say, oh, you need this, you need that. To... No, you need nothing but Christ. And you get to know him and the fellowship you can have with him. We sang this morning, what a fellowship, what a joy divine, leaning on the everlasting arms. The fellowship you can have with him is absolutely incredible but few there be that find it. There is the, one of the old slogans for the Marines, the few, the proud, the Marines. Well, you know what? For the Christians, it's the few, the redeemed, the Christian. I wish there was more of us. I wish we outnumbered the lost, but we don't. And that breaks my heart. Someone sent me this week uh, on uh, uh, something that was posted on Facebook, and you know that if it's on Facebook, I'm not going to see it, but right here, you contribute nothing to your salvation except the sin that made it necessary, Jonathan Edwards. There's nothing you and I can brag about, about, hey, I'm a Christian and you're not. We're not the few, the proud, the Christians. No, we're the few, the redeemed, the Christians, and there's nothing about us that we deserve. All we brought to the equation was our sin, and God so graciously paid it off, and I have no debt with him. And anybody, anybody can have that. If you're here and you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, oh my word, you don't know life. John 3.36 says you've not experienced life yet, but you can. And you do when you meet Jesus Christ. So obviously, there's a wide way and there's a narrow way. Romans chapter 10 says, If you'll confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For the heart man believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. I want to stop for just a second and say, I guarantee you, I'm not saying anything here that 99.9% .9 of you haven't heard many, many times. But somehow, we forget. Somehow, we move on. Somehow, we're thinking about other things. For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. The same Lord is all, over all is rich unto them that call on him. I already touched on the richness. He's rich in that he can pay off anything that you need. He's rich unto all them that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And this is one of the things that motivate me. We've just got the salvation message of Jesus Christ in Romans chapter 10. Okay, How shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him on whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? Now obviously I get to be a preacher. I stand here every Sunday. You expect to see me here when I'm not someone else is. But for the most part it's me. And I recognize I am known as a preacher. 
but you are too. Your life is a walking, talking testament, testimony to the work of Jesus Christ. You are a preacher of Jesus Christ. It is your testimony that makes a difference. I cannot overcome on Sunday morning what you've done through the week if you're not living a real life in front of others. I read a testimony this week of, of a pastor that's basically in trouble. And he was working out at the gym and going through all of these things and kind of flirting with this girl and they'd known each other for a, 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 a period of time. And she shared with him, says, you know, my husband and I are thinking about looking for a church. He says, oh, you need to go to my church. She said she was shocked to hear that he was a pastor. I'm only sharing that because, you know what? Sometimes the way you and I live, when you get ready to share your faith, it's somewhat shocking to people that you're a believer. Oh, oh, oh don't do that. Honestly, sad to say, over the years, we've been here for close to 25 years now, sad to say over the years, not recently, but someone will come, gee whiz, I'm surprised to see so-and-so attends this church. I didn't know they went to church. I cannot overcome on Sunday morning the message of Jesus Christ when through the week they've been living around that as a Christian. Now, I know this isn't popular, and I know it's hurtful, and I don't mean to be mean or mean-spirited, but I'm telling you what, folks, what you and I live, what you and I say, what you and I are doing for the cause of Christ has eternity written all over it for those of us we live around. It is so important that we mean what we say and we say what we mean and we live it out in the way that we walk and talk. It's critical. How shall they hear without a preacher? You're the preacher. Romans 10, 16 to 17 says, but they've not all obeyed the gospel. And they haven't. For Isaiah said, Lord, who hath believed our report? So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Isaiah said, will anyone listen? Will anyone believe? I don't know about you, but I share my faith from time to time, and I, I don't always get the decision I'm looking for. I've been laughed at, told I'm crazy, said you guys don't have any fun, you're Christians. Says, you, know, you know, I'll show you fun. Fun is yesterday morning on the golf course in the pouring rain. Hey, man, oh, that's fun, you know. But I'll tell you what, I can't tell you the joy in living for Jesus Christ. It, I don't have, I, I'm a college dropout anyway, but I don't have good enough English to describe for you the joy there is in Jesus Christ. I can't, I can't pull it off. But I'll tell you what, I do get frustrated at times when we've got the greatest message that the world has ever heard, that Jesus saves. Say that with me. Jesus saves. And knowing Jesus saves, all they have to do is trust Christ as their Savior. All they have to do is realize that he paid their debt. All they have to do is realize that if they'll confess with their mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in their heart that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. It's guaranteed. And they look at you like you're a mule with two heads. And I think, will anybody believe? And I'm telling you this morning, if you're in this room and you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, I will do anything humanly possible to get you to understand to please, please, please choose Jesus Christ because if you don't, the wrath of God abides on you. That's what motivates me. So I'll tell you what, when it's all said and done, the only thing that matters is there's two pe types of people in the world, the lost and the saved. There isn't anything else. You're not almost saved or almost lost. You're, you're, boy, Lord, I'm this close now. No, if you're this close, you're that far. You're not close. You either believe or you don't. <sighs> he came unto his own, his own received him not. <laughs> but as many as received him, to them he gave the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Luke 14, 23, And the Lord said unto the servant, Go out into the highways and hedges and compel them to come in, that my house may be full. So here's the deal. What's our job? You and I are supposed to go out. There was a wedding that was called. Now, I don't know. Today, in this day and age, I'll end with this. I don't know if you, you 
you've noticed or not, but wedding invitations used to be, now we send them out on three-by-five cards or whatever, it's cheaper and uh, it's probably a good idea, but used to be in the old days, you'd get an envelope in the mail. You'd open the envelope, and in the envelope was another envelope. What was that about? And then you open that envelope, and there's an invitation. Mr. and Mrs. So-and-so would like you to invite you to the wedding of their daughter, so-and-so, to Mr. and Mrs. Son So-and-so, and all of the verbiage that goes on in that, and you know there's going to be a wedding. And then they, they ask for an RSVP, and I'll just let you know, RSVPs don't work. No, just, just heads up, Okay. So you're, you're supposed to let them know, but I'll tell you, how awful would it be if you sent out all the invitations and no one came? Holy, I don't know how hurtful that could be. Now, I've never seen that happen. But Jesus tells a story in Luke that they put together a great wedding, and, and uh, he, they sent out the invitations, and everybody started making excuses. Well, you know, I bought some land, and I need to go see it, and one of the guys went and said, I got married, and I can't leave. And uh, so all those things can be joked about. But you know what? God Almighty sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die for you. I don't know what greater gift has ever been given than their own son. I've got two sons. There's zero chance. I would want them to die in your place. I'm saying, I'm just being honest with you. Now, there are men that send out their sons as soldiers, and they do die in my place, quite frankly. But that's a different scenario. I don't know how, how hurtful it is to our Heavenly Father for us to look, uh, what's the word, uh, uncaring, ungrateful, unthankful to the fact that Jesus died on the cross to take our place and we don't care. I'm telling you, that makes God mad. It does. There's going to come a time when we'll stand before the judgment seat of God. And we'll give an account. The Bible says, knowing the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. I don't know about you, but God scares me. I'm not saying, oh, come on, he's your heavenly father. I love him. Our God is an awesome God. I love that song. He reigns in heaven above. But on the other hand, I don't know about you, but I'm a little nervous about standing before him. Not that I'm not saved. I'm, my, my salvation is secure. But there's going to come a time where, ever remember being called to the principal's office at school? Huh? Yeah. Now, no, nobody, you guys never had to go? My name was on there every week, you know? And you're going, I'm not guilty, I'm not guilty, I'm not guilty, I'm not guilty. But I was worried. Okay. I'm going to stand before Jesus Christ, and he's going to look at me, and I'm going to be thinking, I'm not guilty, I'm not guilty, I'm not guilty, but I'm worried. Have I done my best? Have I passed the test? Is he satisfied with me? Living with a purpose. Do you really believe what you say you believe? And if Christ is in your heart, and you have eternal life guaranteed to you through the shed blood of Jesus Christ, that ought to be shaping the decisions you're making and the things that you're doing, and there ought to be a burning desire in your heart and life to please Almighty God and to save that poor soul that's headed for hell. Heavenly Father, I hope what we've talked about has made sense. Our past has led us to where we are today. There are folks in this room that for whatever reason, their past, maybe a friendship, maybe an acquaintance, maybe through a husband or wife, whatever it is, has brought them to the Cornerstone Baptist Church at 11 o'clock on a Sunday morning, and a decision needs to be made. Do they want to honor God in their life by choosing Jesus Christ as their personal Savior? Oh, God, there's no greater choice than that. What we think about God shapes everything about us. And I pray this morning that if there are those here that have never said, Lord Jesus, come into my heart and be my Savior, that they would not look lightly at the sacrifice that Jesus made so that their sins could be forgiven. If we'll confess with our mouth, Lord Jesus, and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. With heads bowed and eyes closed, if you're here this morning, You've never trusted Christ as your personal Savior. I want you to pray this prayer with us. We're going to pray together, Lord Jesus, come into my heart and be my Savior. Forgive my sins. I believe in you. Help me to trust you. 
Thank you for hearing my prayer. Now, those are just words. But if you mix those words with faith and you pray them to God Almighty through a sincere heart, those words become a salvation prayer that extends an invitation that opens your heart's door so that Jesus Christ can come in. And if you'll pray that prayer, you will be guaranteed of eternal life through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. The only thing you need to bring is your sin. So let's pray that prayer together, Cornerstone, very quietly. We'll pray it out loud so that that unsaved person will have someone praying with them. So let's say these words. Dear Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Be my Savior. Forgive my sins. I believe in you. Help me to trust you. Thank you for hearing my prayer. In Jesus' name. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. If you prayed that prayer, not I prayed that prayer 20 times, Pastor. I'm saying if you prayed that prayer this time and you meant it like you've never prayed it before, or maybe you never prayed it before, but you did just now and you meant it and you asked Christ to come into your heart, then that is a huge moment in your life. And we'd like to know that. I won't embarrass you or point you out, but I'd like to know if you trusted Christ today and you prayed that prayer, Christians want to pray for you this week, and we'd like to know it. In the balcony, if you prayed that prayer, would you raise your hand? I'll point to you, and you can put it down. Stan, I prayed that prayer. Thank you. I see that hand. You can put it down. Somebody else in the balcony, I prayed that prayer. I trusted Christ as my Savior. Thank you. I see that hand. You can put it down. Someone else in the balcony, I prayed that prayer. There's two in the balcony that I'm aware of. How about on the main floor? Stan, I prayed that prayer, and I trusted Christ as my Savior. Thank you. You can put your hand down. Thank you. You can put your hand down. Two on the main floor. All right, all over the room now. I prayed that prayer stand and I meant it. I trusted Christ as my Savior. I don't see any other hands. Heavenly Father, thank you for those that made the choice this morning. They entered in at the narrow gate. It's not easy. You told of the Apostle Paul, I'm going to show him the things that he must suffer for my sake. And Lord, we're not saying the Christian life is easy, but it's the best life. Now, Lord, we move on to those that didn't need to raise their hand this morning. They know you as their personal Savior. But I wonder if apathy has crept in. I wonder if they've forgotten what they have in Jesus Christ. I wonder if they've forgotten that those people that they know and love are going to die and go to hell if someone doesn't reach them. Have we prayed for them? Have we spoken to them in love? Have we made a pie for them? Have we done anything we can to endear ourselves to them so they'd hear about our Savior? Lord, perhaps we don't get out of bed on Sunday like we should. Of course, this crowd is here. But are we concerned about learning your word and being students of it? Sunday school was something we used to do, but we don't anymore. It's not that big a deal. Sunday night comes and goes, and we're home, and the golf channel is on, or whatever it is, and we're comfortable. And I was in church this morning. Are we giving our best? Oh, God, I hope you'd be pleased with the Cornerstone Baptist Church. I hope you'd be pleased with the decisions that we're making. I hope that you'd build a fire in our hearts that has only been a flicker and it needs to be a flame. Lord, this morning as we open the altars, I pray that we'd respond in a way that you'd be pleased. Oh Lord, help us to live with a purpose. And that purpose is to honor and glorify you. Lord, we love you. Bless this invitation, please. In Jesus' name. Amen.